Okay, so we continue with the session de code development in Oxford. So I will present uh, the code development on the Sternheimer GW code. So for those of you who don't know, um, the niche that we want to fill with our GW code is um, very accurate calculation of solids. So in particular, we want to have the full band structure. So all of these K points that are present here are actually calculated by the code, so it's not an interpolation scheme. So we can determine then effective masses um, as uh, directly with finite difference methods, and it's not a fit, so it's really the effective mass. And um, we also can do the full spectral function, not just the um, quasi-particle eigenvalues, but actually the frequency-dependent eigenvalues, and then you can also see the satellite peak. Okay, this is in G not W not, it's not physical, but um, in principle we have all this fine structure and then we can compare this with ARPA's experiment. Okay, better? Um, Okay, for those of you who don't know, the theory behind the Sternheimer GW methods is a linear response code based on two different linear equations. So for both for the Green's function and for W, we solve linear problems. For the Green's function, it comes directly from the definition. So it's the, uh, the Green's function to the linear operator is the, the solution to the delta function. And for the screen Coulomb interaction, there are different ways to calculate it. So I present one here. So you consider a Coulombic perturbation and then the linear response to the, of the wave function gives you the, then you can calculate the density response and the density response is the dielectric constant. And the inverse of the dielectric constant times the Coulomb potential is the screen Coulomb interaction. Uh, there's an alternative method where you iterate this. So you can take the density response and put it back in on the, the other side. This gives you a, uh, times the Coulomb potential. This also gives you um, then directly the um, screen Coulomb interaction and you don't need the matrix inversion. So uh, some have also talked about extensively about the uh, build testing that we, build bot testing that we use. So the SGW is also present in this uh, test suite. So we test um, this particular features of the code, system swift inversioncy without inversioncy determining the screen column interaction iteratively or directly and inverting, got beneath plus one pole model, full frequency integration, integration of the imaginary axis and an analytic continuation to the real axis or directly real frequency integration. We can calculate the dielectric constant on the real axis and we can treat film systems. And all of these are nightly tested if there has been any change to the code base to see that we don't break our code. So then in addition to the tests that uh, Samuel introduced, there's also a microscopic testing. <coughs> so this is uh, unit testing. So it tests individual units of the program. So it's only recently started. It's not for all units of the code. So units would be modules or subroutines of your program. The idea is that you provide an exemplary input where you know the exact result. And then you verify that your code reproduces what, you, what it's supposed to do. And the way to do this in Fortran is probably using PF units, the most sophisticated tool that's developed by NASA. So they have a bit more restrictive policies against code stability. So for us, we just wait a bit, waste a bit of supercomputing time. They might crash their spaceship. So um, yeah, the advantage of this is the test code has pseudo Fortran format. So it's very easy to read for someone who has Fortran experience. So one example here, so this is my test code for the linear solver. So you have here, this is the, all this at statements are the extra statements for this test code. And then there's a, so this would be the header, subroutine, and there's a, a class statement here which passes the testing information and this use statement to use the testing routines. And then the code is also very simple, so you, so this is the subroutine I want to test. So first I calculate the solution that's uh, so to the linear problem. So I get out uh, a solution and um, an error flag. So first, of course, the error flag should be uh, not set. So you can see here, again, this is the additional statement coming from the test code. The rest is Fortran code. 
Then we check if we apply the linear operator, we get the same, testing the residual, and then the residual should be smaller than the threshold that we set for our solver. And the linear solver that we use is a multi-shift solver. So the idea is that you have what we want to solve is a linear problem of this kind. So a plus omega i x equals b. So you want to solve this for a lot of different frequencies. And the idea here is that you use a Krylov subspace method. And the Krylov subspace spanned by this operator is the same for all frequencies. So you can see the identity matrix does not change the vector. So the space is the same. So, uh, and now the important part is application of this operator A, so this would be Hamiltonian in our case, is very expensive, whereas shifting it by an identity matrix is very cheap. So the idea is only apply this operator once and then solve all shifted systems at the same time. And the particular one that I implemented is the shifted big step uh, method, which is described in this paper because it has a particular good performance for our system. So you can see this was the previous uh, linear solver. This had some problems to converge to very high accuracy. And now the new solver converges not only faster, it also converges to higher accuracy. OK, how does um, SGW interact with Quantum Espresso? So I use quantum es several quantum es parts of Quantum Espresso as a library. So the lowest level is modules. From modules, I use the custom FFT transformation. I use the image and pool parallelization. I use the IO um, routines of quantum espresso. Um, on top of that, I use from PW, H psi and S psi, the non-self-consistent calculation, the symmetry, uh, and of course, all these common modules. Then on top of that, and now the next level was the LR modules that were introduced last year. <laughs> From this, there are some more common modules to that. There are some helper routines for my own version of Sol Flinter. And I use the setup for the non-self-consistent calculation. And on top of that, I use the SGW code. And this also provides some routines that are more general than just SGW. So the linear solver I talked about could be, in principle, merged back into LR modules. And there are some other routines, like a parallel MP gather. So that's a wrapper around the MPI all gather or MP ga MPI gather. So if there's some interest, these could propagate back to lower levels so that other people in the community can use it. So now, finally, I want to present the uh, Gitflow workflow. So this is the um, workflow which I use to develop the SGW method. So and I want to compare this a bit to the way Quantum Espresso currently works. And perhaps in the future, we can move towards a more sophisticated workflow. So this is more or less the workflow um, Quantum Espresso uses. So you have this trunk with frequent commits. And then at some point, a uh, release version is forked out of that, which is then put to the website. And this is somewhat mirrored in um, my own um, in SGW. So you have a master branch that always will have a commit when there's also a Quantum Espresso release. So they are in sync all the time. And there's a development version, which um, is updated frequently. And this is also, or both of these are tested with the build bot system to verify that these are bug free. So if at some point someone notices a bug, so someone that is outside the scope of build bot, then there's one. If it's a very severe bug in the master, I can do a hot fix directly. And then this, so this would fork from master and merge back into master. And uh, then it's also merged into the development branch. So now, at some point, you want to have the developments that you have from development merged back into master. And this you do by a uh, separate release branch. So the idea is here, OK, at this point, you decide, OK, my version is now stable enough. And then you merge this release branch. This lives for some time where you do some bug fixes, update the version number, and this kind of stuff. And then when it's stable enough, then it merges into master. But in the meantime, you can continue with development. So the developments that you do then are not merged into the current version, but will only propagate into the next release of uh, SGW. And then all almost all developments. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, I don't quite uh, see what, what the role of the master is with respect to release. So, uh, so the, the role of the master is um, 
that you have one commit. Essentially, when someone else uses my code, he can use this version. So this is the stable version, supposed, supposedly bug-free. And so this is the stable version. And then, and then um, at, a, at some point, you decide, OK, I want to do a, um, a new version. And so you don't want to change anything here in master. So if you merge directly from here to master, you might introduce some bugs. And this release branch just protect, provides an additional layer of protection towards the master. So actually, this merge should be almost trivial because there were no changes in master compared to develop. So it will just propagate all changes that you did until here into the master. It's just that now on the master, mm -hmm. there's a new, um, yeah. I mean, if someone checks out this version, it's stable. Whereas if he checks out one of this, there might be still some bug fixes that you need to do to get it stable. So now all major development takes place in uh, so-called feature branches. So the idea is also that this development branch, to make this development branch more stable. So uh, you fork off these feature branches. So this feature branch, I mean, this, these are not long feature branches. So typically for me, one feature is like 20, 30 commits. So one sub, writing one subroutine, something like this. And so this would be like developing the linear solver. Then you do it, develop the unit testing for the linear solver. When all of this uh, works fine, then you merge it back into develop. And then it's available for, P I mean, currently I'm the only developer of this code. But it, the idea is that you protect your development branch as well as your master. Uh, not, not in the same level as the master, but there's some protection to this development branch. <laughs> So if there's some feature that you find doesn't work that you want it to, then you can not merge it into the development branch. Or, um, yeah, so the idea is just to have another more stable branch. And this feature branch are then the thing where the most of the commits happen. OK, so then some future plans is I want to m make the code <coughs> a bit nicer by reducing the amount of global modules and improving the user interface, and then finally release the SGW code, and also if there's interest integrated into Quantum Espresso. OK. Yeah, so yeah, here's some acknowledgment group funding and the Quantum Espresso community, computational resources. And thank you for your attention. OK, thank you.